Before I begin, I have a couple of warnings. Firstly, over the course of this talk, I will speak casually and even flippantly about what were utterly horrendous ordeals. In looking, however briefly, at the legal or political basis for mutilation, it is very easy to overlook the pain, suffering and indeed death caused by such maiming, regardless of its reasoning. So I will try to keep jokes like this to a minimum. Secondly, as you can imagine, such a topic comes with gory details, and given that this is a PowerPoint presentation, there is room for some gruesome pictures. However, I have kept such images to a bare minimum. There is one that is not great, which I shall warn you about in advance, while there is a couple of depictions of acts about to be committed that could be a little uncomfortable. The use of the term Byzantine in the title is to be taken loosely, and possibly even with a small b, not for reasons regarding the Romanity of the Byzantine Empire, but more because we will at times be travelling far from the confines of the 7th century Roman Empire in time and space, even if that period provides something of a narrative outline for this talk. Why the 7th century, you ask? Well, because I have a book to plug. Uh, and we've got to get the cheapest of cheap plugs uh, in there somehow. More seriously, the focus falls somewhat on the 7th century due to the prevalence of Roman imperial mutilation during that period and the transition it goes through as a practice. Indeed, it is to the end of that century that we go for perhaps the most famous example of Roman imperial mutilation. The year is 695 and Justinian II is being led into the Hippodrome of Constantinople having the previous night been deposed as emperor by an uprising in the city, started by two monks, a general recently released from prison, the Patriarch and the Blue and Green Circus factions. The new emperor, said released General Leontius, now had to decide what to do with the deposed Justinian. Historically, there would appear to have been not much of a decision to make. I mean, can you name any Roman emperors who actually survived the end of their reign for any length of time? It is not a long list. Here are a few. Valerian survived for a while. Uh, Diocletian uh, and his colleague Maximian. Uh, Betranio was allowed to retire. Avitus was made uh, a bishop, was murdered within months. Uh, Glycerus was also made a bishop. Romulus Augustulus was famously allowed seemingly to live uh, in retirement in Italy. But these are a very scant few out of the hundreds. Clearly plenty of Roman emperors had christened their reign with the execution of a predecessor or rival to the throne. The most recent example had come with Her when Heraclius, great-great-grandfather of Justinian II, had Phocas executed in 610, while Phocas himself had had Mericius and his sons executed in 602. We might then expect Leontius to treat Justinian in a similar definitive manner, have his head hacked off and be done with it, not only because of the baying crowd in the Hippodrome demanding blood, but also because a merely deposed emperor was always going to be a potential source of trouble. Of the aforementioned list of emperors, to not be killed immediately upon the end of their reign, Diocletian was dragged out of retirement, Maximian reclaimed the imperial title twice, Avitus' supporters claimed a coup in his name, Glycerus reputedly played a role in orchestrating the murder of his successor. However, Leontius decided to show some mercy to Justinian, possibly out of respect for the deposed emperor's father, Constantine IV, who Leontius held in high esteem. There could also be some aspect of the growing religiosity of the imperial position and therefore the man holding it at play here, although that had not prevented the murder of Constance II in 668. While Justinian's life was to be spared, he was not to be spared physical dis discomfort because he had to be made ineligible for retaking the imperial throne and in late 7th century Constantinople this, mean, this meant mutilation. It is somewhat necessary to divide such mutilation into two categories, political and punitive. Political mutilation, the maiming of an individual 
in such a way as to disqualify them from contention for a position of power we will look at later. For now we will focus on punitive mutilation, which you will be forgiven for thinking is something of a tautology. All mutilation is in some sense punitive. But we are talking here about mutilation as a punishment, which had a long and wide history before its introduction into Roman dynastic politics. Punitive mutilation was a prevalent practice in Middle Bronze Age Mesopotamia for it to become extensively prescribed as a punishment in the law code of the Babylonian king Hammurabi in around 1754 BC. As you can see here, for various crimes, we see that his tongue shall be cut out, her breasts shall be cut off, his ears shall be cut off, his hands shall be cut off, the hands of this barber shall be cut off, and, and his ears should be cut off. The whole Yol law code itself is tied up with an invocation of the god Nergal to cut off his limbs with his mighty weapons of any successor to Hammurabi who would ignore his laws. This is something that is part and parcel of uh, Babylonian society. Herodotus 9.1.12 records that when Amestris found out that her husband, the Persian king Xerxes, had had an affair, Amestris targeted the girl's mother, who the queen thought wrongly had put the girl up to it, having her horribly mutilated. Her breasts, nose, ears and lips were cut off and thrown to the dogs. Then her tongue was cut out. This was a proper family affair, as the girl was the daughter of Massistes, brother of Xerxes. She was also married to Darius, son of Xerxes and Mamestris, making her not only Xerxes' lover, but his niece and his daughter-in-law. Amongst the Greeks, the very name of Amazon was taken to be the Greek Amazos, breastless. This was then taken further by the suggestion that the Amazons cut or burnt off their right breast so that they could draw their bows without impediment. This folk etymology has been thoroughly rejected, with the lack of depiction of this supposedly chosen and beneficial mutilation in ancient art being highlighted. The Amazons are always represented with both breasts, although one is frequently covered. Another such instance of purported breast mutilation stems from this very island, and would seem to straddle the boundary between punitive and political mutilation. The old Cranog man, an Iron Age bog body found in Offaly in June 2003, has, amongst other injuries, several deep cuts under each of his nipples. One theory is that this is deliberate and linked to an ancient Irish practice of sucking on a nipple as a gesture of submission to a man in a position of power. In his Confessio 1.8, And so on that day I refused to suck the breasts of these men from fear of God. St. Patrick seems to hint at such a practice. Mutilating or even removing a nipple or breast may therefore be a symbolic exclusion of this man from contention for the throne. This could posit Old Cranach Man as a rejected ruler of some sort, but this is not universally accepted, and neither is the suggestion that he has been politically mutilated. While it made room for the amputation of hands, ears, tongue and breasts in its laws, one appendage that is absent from the Code of Hammurabi as a target for punitive amputation is the one that Justinian II was about to lose in the Hippodrome, his nose. The nose is not only important as an olfactory organ, but also as an aesthetic element for its symbolic value and as an expression of the character of the subject. It is unsurprising then that it was targeted for punitive amputation long before the 7th century. And again here I warn you about what uh, we're about to see. This is a particularly devastating example of rhinocopia, the cutting off of the nose. Uh, I dare say that should the removal have been completed here, uh, and even if it had not, such a devastating injury would have been fatal, which may indeed have been the point in some instances. While the Babylonians of Hammurabi did not authorise rhinocopia as a punishment, other old civilizations did. Under the Egyptian pharaoh Hammurab, rhinocopia was used as a punishment for officials found to have abused their power and for those found to have committed adultery. 
A century later, it was also a punishment for insurrection under Ramesses III, who had the noses and ears of several plotters from the Great Harem Conspiracy mutilated. In Hindu mythology, when she attacked his sister-in-law, the demonic Shurpanika had her nose cut off by Lakshmana, the celebration of which became central in the Nakataya festival. Indeed, so prevalent was rhinocopia as a punishment in ancient India that the subcontinent developed medical skill and technological advances in nasal reconstructive surgery in the first millennium BC. Jumping ahead of our Byzantine period, Frederick II, 13th century Holy Roman Emperor, used rhinocopia to punish adulterers and pimps. In the 14th and 15th century, in Poland, Lithuania, rhinocopia was used as to punish crimes committed through speech, while in the 15th century, in Naples, it was used as a punishment for crimes of a sexual nature. Such punishment also appears in the first millennium AD Peruvian and Mesoamerican cultures, with ancient pottery suggesting examples of lip, leg, foot and nose amputation as penalties for bearing false witness, theft and laziness. However, it could be that some of these examples are actually medical amputations rather than punitive mutilations. Particularly large examples of rhinocopia stem from late 16th century Japan. In battle, it was part of Japanese tradition to claim war trophies. Indeed, samurai warriors might only be paid according to the number of kills they could provide proof of. This had seen the collection of severed heads, but such was the number of dead caused by the Japanese invasion of Korea under the leadership of Toyotomi Hideyoshi in the 1590s and the impracticality of carrying so many heads, samurai resorted to taking noses instead. These nasal trophies were then taken back to Japan and eventually buried in a tomb. One such tomb was found near Osaka in 1983, containing 20,000 severed noses, which were then returned to Korea and cremated in 1992. There is another nose tomb in Kyoto called the Minizuka, literally the ear mound. Uh, why that might be, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, is nose mound considered too barbaric? But it doesn't seem any worse than ear mound. Heading back in space and time to the ancient Mediterranean, mutilation as a punishment does not seem to have been prominent in the early Roman Empire. It was seemingly restricted to images in the form of damnatio memoriae and to the corpses of criminals such as Sejanus. However, that is not to say that punitive mutilation was non-existent. Sections of Marshall's epigrams suggest that rhinocopia, however infrequent, was considered a punishment for adultery under the Principate. You have disfigured, O husband, the wretched adulterer and his face, shorn of nose and ears, misses its former self. Do you believe you are sufficiently avenged? You mistake, he still has other activities. Who induced you to cut off the adulterer's nose? It was not by this part, husband, you were sinned against. You fool, what have you done? Your wife has nothing lost in this quarter, seeing the organ of your de Phobos is safe and sound. It might be expected that the Christianization of the Roman Empire did away with even this hint of brutal maiming as a punishment. However, if anything, punitive mutilation increased under a Christian Roman Empire. While there is perhaps no correlation between these two developments, Christianized Romans could point to the Bible for justification for such brutality. Matthew 5, 29-30 proffers the advice that you should cut off your hand or your foot if it scandalises you, and better being lame or crippled rather than able-bodied and damned. In another biblical reference, Leviticus 21, 16-20, we may even have some of the inspiration for the political mutilation of the Christianized Roman Emperor. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and say, no one of your offspring throughout their generations who has a blemish may approach to offer the food of his God. For no one who has a blemish shall draw near, one who is blind or lame, or one who has mutilated face, or a limb too long, or one who has a broken foot or a broken hand, or a hunchback or a dwarf, or a man with a blemish in his eyes, 
or an itching disease or scabs or crushed testicles. In short, for a man to hold the position of High Priest of Judea, he was to be without physical blemish. We have an example of this divine command being carried out during the wars surrounding the end of the Roman Republic. The Parthian invasion of the Roman East in 40 BC saw their Hasmonean ally, Antigonus II, Mattathias, appointed King and High Priest of Judea. This was in opposition to John Hyrcanus II, who was seized, deposed and had his ears mutilated to prevent his retaking of the High Priesthood. In his previous version of the events, Josephus paints a far more grisly scene. Antigonus himself also bit off Hyrcanus's ears with his own teeth as he fell down upon his knees to him so that he might never be able upon any mutation of affairs to take the high priesthood again for the high priests that officiated were to be complete and without blemish. This situation is only made worse by the fact that Antigonus was Hyrcanus II's nephew. In a seemingly contrary way it may be that the increase in mutilation in the late Roman Empire was the result of a reduction in the severity of punishments, physical maiming as a merciful substitute for the death penalty. This trend had begun at least as early as the first half of the 6th century with the novels of Justinian I, which also saw the downgrading of certain mutilation punishments as well. This lessening of punishment and the increasing use of mutilation continued throughout the 7th century and on to 726 when it was recodified in the Ecloga of Leo III. It is notable, notable, although perhaps not surprising, that the doling out of physical punishment in the Ecloga depended on the financial means of the guilty. A rich person could pay a fine for their crime. A poor person was forced to pay with a part of their body. The Ecloga is also more likely to deal with crimes against the state, such as counterfeiting and forgery, which were punishable by losing a hand a reduction from beheading, but that does not mean that it was the only use of these type of public crimes that were to be punished by mutilation. Ecloga 1727 codified rhinocopia as the punishment for adultery. Another correction of laws and rules probably from the late 7th century and dealing more with the day-to-day -day running of the provinces called the Nomos Georgius the Farmer's Law records four different types of mutilation as punishment for crimes against the individual. We have blinding for a third offence of theft. We have branding for the destruction of property. The cutting out of the tongue for swearing falsely. And the cutting off of a hand or hands for more grievous destruction of property. It was not just in the Roman Empire of late antiquity that mutilation was employed as a legal punishment. The Frankish king Childebert II, 570-595, is recorded condemning a group of plotters to various forms of maiming. Some were thrown into prison, some had their hands amputated and afterwards released, some had their ears and noses cut off and were then sent out as a subject of ridicule. Perhaps the most well-known mutilation of a, as a legal punishment comes from Islam. Islamic law's use of amputation as a punishment derives from sections of the Quran which mandated hudud, meaning boundaries, punishments. There are several types of crime said to violate Allah's hudud in the Quran, but for our purposes here the two most cogent examples are what we might consider highway robbery and some forms of theft. This punishment of those who wage war against Allah and his messenger and strive with might and main with mischief through the land is execution or crucifixion or the cutting off of hands and feet from opposite sides or exile from the land that is their disgrace in this world and a heavy punishment is theirs in the hereafter as to the thief male or female cut off his or her hands a punishment by way of example for Allah for their crime and Allah is exalted in power why this type of punishment has become attached to the implementing of harsh Sharia law, it would appear that such mutilation, particularly in instances of theft, was rarely applied. 
This would seem to be because the evidentiary standards were extremely high. Muslim jurists throughout the centuries felt that the slightest doubt or ambiguity should avert the harsher Uhud punishments. Essentially, without a full and unretracted confession in court, meeting Uhud punishment requirements, particularly for instances of petty theft, were almost impossible. It would seem that punishments such as crucifixion and mutilation merely being on the statute was taken as a deterrent rather than actually to be carried out. That is not to say that certain Islamist regimes over the centuries have ignored the seemingly vital aspect of Islamic jurisprudence. However, so far, aside from perhaps the ghastly fate of John Hyrcanus II, none of what we have looked at yet is really to be considered political mutilation. Rather than strictly a punishment for a crime, political mutilation was seen as an effective way to remove an individual from candidacy for the imperial throne. Physical imperfection as a potential disqualifier from rule was nothing new. Not only do we have the aforementioned blemish-free Jewish high priests, the 4th century BC Spartan king Adjusilius II was thought ill-suited to rule due to having been born lame, while the Roman Emperor Claudius's various physical maladies were thought to not only rule him out as an imperial candidate, but even from a career in the public eye. It must be said that both of these men enjoyed prolonged periods on the thrones they were supposedly disqualified for. Adjusilius was king of Sparta for nearly 40 years, while Claudius was emperor for 13 years. However, the Christianizing of the position of the Roman emperor increased the want for the man sitting on the imperial throne to be physically unblemished. As a representative of God in this temporal world, the emperor must be free from obvious imperfections. So the ideal of physical mutilation increasingly became a political weapon. The focus for the origins of Roman political mutilation usually falls on the punishments of John Athelricus and the Magister Officiorum Theodore, the illegitimate son and nephew of the Emperor Heraclius respectively for their roles in a conspiracy in 637. However, there are some earlier examples of mutilation from late antiquity which might carry dynastic dimensions. The son of the Emperor Jovian from 363 to 364, Veronianus, who was passed over for the throne for being too young on his father's death, may have had an eye put out from fear of what was to follow, possibly to remove him as a dynastic threat to the new emperor Valentinian I. In the early 5th century, Priscus Attalus, twice a Goth-backed usurper for the imperial throne, had his hand mutilated after his capture in 416. He died soon after in exile on the Lepari Islands, possibly as a result of the mutilation. Maybe. The usurper, Johannes, upon his defeat and capture, had his hand cut off before being paraded on Rome on a donkey. It is difficult to ascertain if any of these mutilations were meant to remove the victim from the line of succession, or were meant as merely punitive punishments. In the case of Johannes, it was quickly followed by his execution, so his imperial candidacy was not a factor. While it could be that the necessary physical perfection of the Roman Emperor was in play by the late 4th century, these three incidents may be coloured by the future Roman tendencies towards mutilation as a dynastic tool. Other men removed from imperial contention in the 5th century were either killed or made to enter the church, rather than mutilated or exiled. It is not even clear if the punishments of John Athelricus and Theodore in 637, both had their nose and hands removed while the latter also had lost a leg, were meant solely as punitive or had a dimension of removing both from imperial candidacy. Could the harsher treatment of Theodore reflect some dynastic considerations? Not only was the Magister Officiorum maimed to a greater degree, he was also exiled farther away, uh, the Malta Islands, compared to John being sent to Principo off the coast of Constantinople. Could it be that the legitimate son of Heraclius' brother was seen as a more of a dynastic threat than the illegitimate Athelaricus? Or was there little to no dynastic aspect to these punishments, and Heraclius found it easier to treat his nephew more harshly than his son? Whatever its meaning at the time, the mutilation and exile of John Athelricus and Theodore proved something of a watershed for such dynastic maiming. Within four years, it would be used again. After a struggle for the throne, three of Heraclius' remaining sons, Heraclonus, 
David Tiberius and Marinus were stripped of their imperial positions and had their noses cut off before being exiled. The youngest son, possibly Marinus, was also subjected to castration, with the damage done leading directly to his death. One other son, Theodosius, escaped physical mutilation due to him being a deaf mute, which had already removed him from the line of succession. Heraclius' second wife and niece, Martina, was seen as the instigator of the political turmoil after her husband's death, and she also faced exile and the loss of her nose, although she also saw the loss of her tongue, which might be more of a personal punishment. Dynastic mutilation then jumped an Heraclean generation, for while Constans II is recorded as tonsuring and even then executing his younger brother Theodosius in 660, there is no mention of any mutilation. Constance's son, however, Constantine IV, did resort to rhinocopia when it came to removing his brothers Heraclius and Tiberius from imperial contention. This meant that at least nine members of the Heraclian imperial family, including one who had ruled as emperor, had faced mutilation by 695, and it was soon to become ten. Before the baying crowd in the Hippodrome in 695, Justinian II suffered the horrors of rhinocopia and glostomia, the mutilation of both the nose and tongue. While a horrific ordeal, Justinian's glostomia does not appear to have been too debilitating. He was still able to speak. His tongue was therefore likely probably slit rather than removed. As for his nose, while he was fortunate to have the wounds heal without any serious infection, the mutilator's knife had not done any half measures. Justinian's nose was gone. It was drastic enough that he would be remembered as Rhinocopomenos, or Rhinotometos, the slit-nosed. Modern depictions of Justinian II tend to focus on his reported use of a prosthetic nose made for out of gold. However, there is no real direct information about where this prosthesis may have come from or how it was attached. So such depictions are relying on anachronistic assumptions and guesswork. That said, the use of such prosthetics may not have been unheard of in the 7th century, illustrated by a story, admittedly recorded in the 9th century, of how a companion of the Prophet Muhammad lost his nose in battle and took to wearing a silver replacement. And when he complained about it starting to smell, Muhammad counselled him to get a gold one instead. It has also been suggested that Justinian underwent some form of operation to repair his nose, leading to what is depicted here in the Carmagnola Porphyry in St Mark's Square, Venice. However, the identifying of the Carmagnola as Justinian II relies on very flimsy evidence. Either it's likely Constantinopolitan origin, being looted from the 4th century in 1204, the imperial diadem that the, the head sports, and the mutilated, mutilated nose, uh, and the latter is doing a lot of the heavy lifting here. Contrastingly, there are several hurdles to get over in order to accept that this is a depiction of the nasally reconstructed Justinian II. Late 7th century was not an era of imperial busts and statues. Statue rhinocopia is hardly rare. There is no backing in the written sources for such reconstructive surgery. Would Justinian really have been depicted as imperfect? His coins, as we can also see here, would say no. Uh, and also, perhaps more damningly, it looks nothing like him. There's no beard, there's shorter, shorter hair, rounded rather than narrow face and pointed chin. It just doesn't look anything like him. While now seemingly removed from imperial contention, even a mutilated Justinian could still be a problem for the new regime. It could be that even if Leontius had no intention of killing his predecessor outright, he may have hoped that the wielder of the knife had been, would be heavy-handed and cut a little too deeply, leaving this merciful mutilation to become fatal. Leontius then would be free from a rival and from accusations that he had executed an anointed emperor. Indeed, any subsequent demise from a supposedly non-fatal mutilation would be seen as judgment from God. When that did not happen, 
Justinian was exiled to one of the most remote Roman outposts, Cherson in the Crimea. It is perhaps a little surprising that Justinian was not made to enter the church, but then mutilation and exile was thought to be enough to remove him from the political scene. Such an assumption overlooked the tenacity of Justinian II. Over the next 10 years, Justinian gathered a small group around him, negotiated a marriage alliance with Khazar Turks, survived betrayal and assassination attempts, escaped to the Danube by boat, where he contrived an alliance with the Bulgar king, marched on Constantinople, stole into the city and regained the throne in 705. The failure of Rhinocopia to conclusively disqualify Justinian from imperial contention may have seen it fall out of fashion. Before Justinian's restoration, his deposer, Leontius, had himself been deposed, mutilated and confined to a monastery by Tiberius III, both of whom were now beheaded on Justinian's order. In 711, Justinian II was again overthrown, with the agents of his second successor, Philippicus Bardanes, taking no chances. They immediately lobbed off his head. Somewhat peculiarly though, while the next three emperors, Bardanes, Anastasius II and Theodosius III, were all deposed, none of them were immediately executed. All three were instead confined to monasteries, with Anastasius II later trying his hand at regaining the throne, only to be defeated and beheaded. Theodosius may have lived out his life as the Bishop of Ephesus. Neither Anastasius nor Theodosius are recorded being physically mutilated, but Bardanes was blinded, with his death soon after possibly being due to the messiness, shock or infection from his blinding. Justinian II might have begun this trend towards blinding in his dealings with what he perceived as treacherous church leaders. Callinicus, Patriarch of Constantinople, who had supported his deposition in 695, and Felix, the Archbishop of Ravenna, who had been stirring up opposition to the papacy in Italy. While there is no record of the method of blinding used for Callinicus, it was almost certainly horrifically pointy, Felix was faced with a peculiar method, perhaps with the aim of not spilling his blood. A silver dish was heated to the point of incandescence and filled with vinegar, the Archbishop was then forced to stare into the steaming vinegar until it destroyed his sight. Admittedly, this comes from a source hostile to Justinian, uh, maybe looking to build up his barbaric reputation. Whether influenced by the fates of Callinicus, Felix or Philippicus Bardanes or not, blinding replaced nose and tongue mutilation as the way to punish and remove individuals from imperial contention as the 8th century wore on. Other than outright execution, blinding remained a punishment and dynastic preventative throughout, the vir throughout virtually the entire remaining life of the Roman Empire. As you can see here, there's a rather long list of potential candidates who were blinded in some way. To finish off, we jump again forward in time to this man, Frederick the Great, uh, Prussian King, 1740 to 1786. Uh, and it's sort of the story that goes behind this picture. He threatens these very uh, peasants here with cutting out their tongues uh, and cutting off their ears. Their crime, refusing to heed his advice on eating potatoes. As an Irishman, I think that might suggest a just punishment. Thank you. <laughs>